welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Sam Bakken, Senior Product Marketing Manager at OneSpan. OneSpan is a company that provides various forms of security technology for financial companies. I brought them on the show specifically to talk about biometrics, how they're evolving, and how they're going to keep us safe. And with that, here's my interview with Sam. Hello, Sam. Hey there. How are you? Good. Thanks for taking the time today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Can't wait. So Sam Bakken, Senior Product Marketing Manager at OneSpan. Tell us about OneSpan. OneSpan is, you know, essentially an anti-fraud and digital identity solutions company. We help banks and financial institutions protect their customers from digital fraud, like account takeover and application fraud and that sort of thing. Our portfolio includes things like digital identity verification, risk analytics, mobile application security, multi-factor authentication biometrics, e-signatures, you name it. Anything that kind of enables real-time fraud detection while protecting the digital customer journey and improving that customer experience at the same time, you can bet that OneSpan does that. Excellent. So short answer is you were the guys that let me access my money remotely while keeping everybody out. Correct. (laughs) And making it easier for you to do that, right? Trying to remove as many boundaries or, or, or obstacles as possible to make that as easy and secure as possible. Excellent. So let's talk about your history in the company. So basically, tell me about the origins of the company. Tell me about your involvement. How'd you get into play here? Yeah, so um, OneSpan has been around for 20, more than 20 years, around for a long time, kind of cut teeth as a provider of hardware tokens for financial services, mostly uh, getting its start in EMEA, but turning into a really a global company. And then since then, with the dawn of mobile and mobile and digital banking taking off, just continuing to to innovate and provide new technology and solutions to help uh, banks deliver that to their customers. So me, myself, I came immediately before OneSpan, I came from a company uh, that focused on mobile app security testing, which you know essentially sort of automated testing as well as penetration testing to kind of mm-hmm. run apps through tools and find vulnerabilities in those apps or sort of insecure coding practices and that sort of thing to then mm-hmm. secure those apps. That company was a lot of financial services companies, government and that sort of thing as well. But then I came to OneSpan just because it was fun for me to get on the other side and, you know, sell some markets and sell solutions to some of those problems that were identified at my prior company. So again, solving the, or, um, solving the problem, selling the, the security controls that can help solve those weaknesses that are identified, that really appealed to me at one span. And now I've been at one span, gosh, I think I'm going on three years now. So it, it's been a good journey for me, for sure. Excellent. So Interesting, because I mean, you do have both both ends of the spectrum in terms of the uh, in terms of the experience. So that must have been definite value once you moved over there. So let's face facts: you guys are the front line of defense in the digital world. So specifically, I brought you on to talk about you know how this is changing, in particular around biometrics. So let's let's just for the audience first define biometrics, and then we can talk about some of the more interesting use cases or interesting technology that, you, that you're starting to see implemented. And we can discuss the challenges surrounding that. So biometrics, big term, what does it mean? Yeah, so I mean, just to put it sort of simply, and as we get started here, is it's it's physical traits, biological traits, sometimes also used that can be used to identify someone in a unique way, right? Whether that's their iris, whether that's their face, whether that's their fingerprint, it can be voice. I mean, it really runs the gamut of any sort of way a profile can be built about someone's physical traits. You can potentially call that a biometric, which again is just a unique way to identify. To a, a human, that's sort of what it boils down to, I guess. Yep. I mean, we've all become, you know, this used to be the realm of almost science fiction way back in the day, yeah. but, you know, like we've all become used to the very slow incremental gains that we've made in society with this, like touch IDs down onto face IDs. Now, like I don't even sign into my computer anymore if I'm wearing my Apple Watch. By proximity, it knows that that watch was put on, authenticated. The contact has not been broken with my flesh, so therefore it's me. So we're all we've all seen this sort of stuff. I mean, we all see the you know the spy movies where the eye gets ripped out and people hold it up to the scanner. <laughs> it's gonna do that. Or the old one where you cut off the hand, you know that sort of stuff. But yeah. um, there's more security to it than just that. So let's talk about how you see the evolution of this and and where where it's where we are today and where it's going. And let's 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 uh, tackle it that way. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, as you know, where we're at, as you mentioned, you know, with mobile phones and sort of just the 
super duper power that that is in these computers in our pockets. We've all become more and more used to to using our fingerprint to log into something, using our face with Apple's Face ID. And you know, a lot of consumers, um, users, just people in general, are becoming more and more comfortable um, using biometrics to log into accounts and the like. And so. We're getting to this sort of, I don't think we're quite there, but we're almost getting to a critical mass where it's just like potentially a username and a password, right? Because biometrics, it's it's easier. You don't have to enter in information on a, on a small keyboard. It's quicker to log in, but I think we're going to see more and more adoption of this. You know, I, we already do see it in a lot of banking apps that will at the least allow you to enable biometric login based on sort of device native technology, right? So if you have an, it sounds like you have a, an iPhone as I do. And of course we can log in with our face or fingerprint there. And a lot of our mobile banking apps will allow us to kind of um, enroll our touch ID or face ID. So I think more and more banks, to be honest, I don't know that there are many banks that are not offering that at this point. You know, how many people are able to take advantage of that is, is probably questionable because not all devices have that sort of dedicated hardware integrated within them. You know, you're probably well aware, but the Apple, uh, the camera for, for Face ID is really specialized hardware. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And so not everybody has an iPhone, obviously. So in terms of things that it, like sort of let's first look at sort of immediate. Actually, kind no, of, yeah, go yeah, ahead. You're bringing go up ahead. an interesting point there, right? Like not everybody has the same hardware, right? I mean, like Apple likes to espouse the advantages of the fact that they control the entire ecosystem. So therefore, you know, they know the hardware they're on. But when you're when you're a service provider sitting on multiple platforms, that has got to be a massive challenge in terms of confirming authentication when, I mean, Apple uniform policy, but there's an infinite number of, almost infinite number of, of Android iterations. And if I buy a phone, I expect to be able to use my phone's, my, my bank's app within that phone. How much of a challenge is that at this stage in the game right now? given the lack of homogeneity? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a big one, right? And again, just, being able to provide a, a consistent user experience for biometrics and login across all of those devices, but having to count on, in Apple's case, I think in general, you know, people have trust for of Apple and their security and that sort of thing. But at the same time, it's a black box for a financial mm-hmm. institution, right? They just kind of yeah. have to trust it. And like, it's not a completely ridiculous or stupid thing to do, but it makes a lot of like security minded folks a little nervous that they just have to yeah. trust it. And, you know, what the case that the case can be on some of these consumer grade devices is that potentially the security leans a little bit more towards, well, not the security rather, but the threshold, you know, it's always a balance between convenience and security. I think we're all kind of mm-hmm. familiar with that that sort of concept, but consumer grade devices like the iPhone potentially, but also especially some of those Android Samsung devices, they tend to lean a little bit more towards customer or user convenience rather than security maybe. And so some banks policies about to what degree of certainty does someone's face have to match the enrolled face, which is you know a configuration that anybody can make the decision on, they can't change that when it comes to the device. Mm-hmm. If it's dependent on that hardware and that system, they can, however, if they use what's called third party biometric solutions, where it's a vendor that provides software that, yes, can be used on a mobile device, but it can use simply a camera on that device. It doesn't have to be a, a hardware, a dedicated sort of camera for that sort of thing. Can one allow you to serve more customers, allow more customers to take advantage of biometrics? Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, even with the camera, there's there's certain ways you can, you know, take a picture of a fingerprint using that camera as well. So it's not just facial recognition, but all of those third-party companies now as well, they typically have more robust uh, liveness detection, which is, and you're kind of talking about sci-fi horror sort of uh, uh, <laughs> possibilities earlier where, you know, you're cutting off somebody's hand or, or something like that. Um, but they have liveness detection to make sure that, A, this biometric sample that is being provided comes from a live person. It is, as you had mentioned, there is blood for example, flowing through it. Now that wouldn't happen mm-hmm. in facial recognition per se, right? It's more yeah. um, sort of trying to detect screens or photos, maybe motion. And there's any number of algorithms that kind of are taken into account to ensure that. But again, yes, it's a challenge, just kind of bringing it full <laughs> yeah. circle here, right? So yes, it's a challenge. Yes, some of that device native stuff is a black box. So, you know, people making security decisions at financial institutions get a little bit nervous about that, not knowing exactly how it works. Mm-hmm. And 
you can't always deliver a consistent user experience across all devices. So that's another thing. But there are, I guess my point is there are options to kind of uh, still offer those biometrics across devices in a consistent manner. Excellent. So we talked about basically what people are familiar with. What other biometric tricks are you know up you guys up your sleeve these days? Like what else are we maybe is in place we don't even know yet? Like that, that we're utilizing, but we don't even know. In terms of what we are utilizing that we don't know, <laughs> that gets a little spooky, right? But yeah. if I'm a for example, let's talk about one, which is behavioral biometrics. Mm-hmm. So that's something where you're gonna get explicit permission from someone uh, to potentially use behavioral biometrics to monitor them as they are interacting with a banking app, for example. How do they, at what angle do they hold the phone? Where on the buttons of the keypad are they typically hitting? How do you build a pattern around that to build sort of a profile of that person's behavior? You know, how do they typically hold the device in terms of the gyroscope and that stuff? You can build a profile on that. You can then compare continuously through a session of someone interacting with the app. So it's really sort of an invisible way to make sure it's still the person you think it is interacting with the app and not someone kind of hijacking the session. Now, that is a great way to kind of be monitoring. And then, you know, it shouldn't be the only thing that you're doing though, right? Because if you then get to some sort of really high value transaction where you just, you really still want to make sure everything looks right, but gosh, this is a, I don't know, $5,000 transfer to an account that has never been transferred to before from this account. Let's just, let's go ahead and get a fingerprint or let's go ahead and get a facial recognition scan going just to be doubly sure for those high value items. But for payments where someone's sending under $100, for example, or sending it to people that they've always sent it before, maybe that behavioral biometrics item is is enough to kind of uh, uh, let that go through for a transaction such as that. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all seen stuff like that. I mean, and that's that to me actually sounds probably a little bit more secure than what I'm used to, which is typically like, oh, I'm going to get a text message basically saying, oh, this person's been added or an email saying this person's been added. And, like, you know, like emails get hacked, text messages, you know, SIM cards get spoofed. These subtle cues that really that kind of behavioral stuff you're talking about there, like it's, it's, it's pretty much impossible to fake that, right? Like you're not going to watch the way someone holds their phone and how they type and, and learn to become like a copycat mimic of that, right? That's not going to happen. So, you know, and as you said, like it's, it's, it's interesting too, because I've had this conversation around security and biometrics in the past and it's, you know, you guys aren't looking for the one thing anymore. You're kind of putting together a mosaic of, Okay, Absolutely. is this this person? We have these data points to say it's probably this person. And as the conversation evolves, is it still this person? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. It is no one biometric. It is no one sort of risk signal. Like, you, you, I mean, you described it perfectly. It's a mosaic. It's, it's, and it's so much, it's a multitude of pieces of information, which with more data, you can make more accurate decisions. You're building high, higher fidelity sort of profiles of your users. And when you can make more accurate decisions, you don't have to get in the way as often and you're reducing false positives. And again, just kind of tying it back to that, you're providing a better user experience because you're not getting in the way. But at the same time, I always say, and I probably stole this from somebody, but a good user experience is a secure one. So you're mm-hmm. making it all the more secure as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think back to how far we've come where back in the day, people saying, oh, I would ever, I would never put my credit card in the internet, uh, on the internet. And now we are at the stage where we trust our phones to hold that data. <laughs> like it's come a long way. And part of it was the, was the trust factor of, of what the biometrics have brought us, right? It's like, oh, you know, I, I, actually I'll share a personal story. I actually get frustrated when the alternative happens now. And there's a grocery store where I got into a debate with the, with the person basically cashing me out because I needed to, you know, I did a face ID transaction to pay for this thing. And then they still wanted mm. me to sign. I'm sitting there going like, I'm like, yeah. like, I'm in a hurry with my kids. I'm like, what, why do you need my signature? They're like, well, because you spent this much money. I'm like, explain to me how that's more, like a scribble is more, more secure than my face. Like I even tweeted out to the, to the company and said like, seriously, like what is going on here? And they're like, what location did that happen at? <laughs> right? so yeah. Something's going on there, but it's the point now where once you, once we've gone past, like for many of us, once we've gone past what is novel and different and it's become normal, trying to go back now. I mean, I try to imagine like a world without face ID and touch ID and all this sort of stuff, especially now in COVID, like good luck. Like it's like, oh, yeah, we're never man. going back. For sure. And in terms of sort of, uh, for one, I love that you brought up the signature thing. Because I just like for my entire life, and perhaps I'm sort of admitting some ignorance here or something, but even when I was like a kid, I was just like, 
a signature doesn't mean anything. Oh, I know. Don't I can stop. I can forge my mom or dad's signature. People don't even look at the signatures. I regularly change my signature. And again, we're talking about written signatures, but it just it's always kind of troubled me that we pay that uh, any mind. I know. almost feel like that's just like this 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 position. I've had this debate so many times. Because I mean, like prior to COVID, like trying to get many of these companies to take e-signature on anything was just a non-starter, right? And I almost feel like the people who put the resistance, it's not only just an ignorance to the entire thing or just, just playing, you know, putting your, your fingers in your ears saying, I'm, you know, I'm not paying attention to this. I almost feel like it's like, it's the illusion of the control of the ego. Like we, oh no, I sign, I am doing this. I am consenting all this other stuff. When really like you're sacrificing security for the belief that you act for the illusion of control and you didn't have control. Yeah. Like, yeah. let's just, just give up on that already. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of yeah. education that needs to happen with that stuff, for sure. Yeah, I have literally asked, like, people who said, no, you can't do that because it's not secure. I'm like, so let me get this straight. DocuSign, which I can use to buy a house, which has been around since, like, 2012 or something like that, or longer, 2004 or something like that. That is less secure than a scribble on a page. <laughs> Explain that to me. Well, I might also say it might be less secure than uh, one span sign, which is fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. As well, let me throw that in there as a marketing. Well, guy, I, I'm willing. I'm willing to bet that, given the fact that your <laughs> your your I'll say a slightly more enterprise focused solution, I'm willing to bet that that is probably a valid statement. Appreciate that. But anyway, <laughs> I know I get your point. I totally get your point, right? Because there's so much sort of contextual data you can gather as you're getting that electronic signature that you could not with a, just a written signature. And it's like wow. the non-repudiation of that and the data trail, the audit trail that's there is like like the, the, the security benefits, the, the legal benefits, et cetera, et cetera, are just like mind boggling. So yeah. we're on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of where we are today. So we talked about some of the stuff we're not seeing, like what's next, like what's coming, like what, how do you see this evolving? In terms of us using, you know, just the our, our for lack of a better term, our existences as proof of who we are. Yeah, and I so first of all, like the gamut of potential biometric stuff is like it's really cool. Like there's a bunch of stuff. People yeah. are studying a bunch of stuff to figure that out. For me, it all boils down to how we want to interface with our various devices. So let me give you an example. This one kind of maybe sounds crazy, but it I and it, it sounded sort Crazy's of crazy. our wheelhouse on this show for the record. Okay. So <laughs> okay. Like, let's, just, right. let's just go right there. All right. Well, I'm preaching to the choir then. But no, just like so I I have wireless ear, you know, I have I have um AirPods or whatever, right? Quite yeah. like them. And I think that I will be more and more just kind of leaving them in my ears, for example. And there mm-hmm. there are there is a biometric method whereby you can, and I'm not saying that AirPods do this right now. I'm saying it's a possible sort of future innovation slash application where it sends sort of sound down your ear canal and there's a reflection back that, you know, there's mm. a pattern, a profile that can be uh, created there. So Sonar scans your ear your, your hole. That's hilarious. But yeah. Well, essentially, but, and yeah, and it's like, wow, that is pretty funny. And like, really? And it's like, well, look, man, if I'm on the, if I'm on the train and I like need to send my wife some money or need to send somebody some money. And I don't want to have to like get my face in the frame for a, for a facial recognition scan or something like that. But my, the AirPod is already in my ear. And then that's enough to kind of validate that it's me because it's my ear canal. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And again, like you were sort of mentioning earlier, right? You can sort of do that on a semi, whatever the sort of right frequency is. But you Mm -hmm. can do that on a regular basis to kind of just keep maintaining that it's the legitimate user that still has the device in their hand that they're they're using. So again, it just it's so dependent on the interface. And again, this is you think about the fact that all of us are you know we're wearing masks and Face ID does not right now. I'm not all the way caught up on what's going to happen with iOS 14, but I don't think they're going to be able to solve for the problem where you know you can't. We wear masks. No, yeah, not a chance. They have changed it so that like it doesn't try a bunch of times before prompting mm-hmm. you for your PIN code. So that's a good step in the right direction. But nonetheless, it's sort of potentially cutting down on the convenience of that if you're out and about because you're probably wearing a mask. And so, what is the next? What else could we use? Well, voice starts to make some sense. Now, don't get me wrong. I I haven't thought this all the way through because to me, it seems a little weird for me to be like on my phone saying transfer X to this person, whatever, in front of a bunch of people in public. I'm probably not super what sort I'm looking for. I'm not super uh, comfortable with that per se. 
But nonetheless, it's like, again, it's that interface. How am I gonna interact with, with the device and what um, sort of sensors will be used as a result of that, that can then be used to build a profile, a biometric profile of the person to create this pattern that uniquely identifies the person to a degree of certainty that uh, we're all sort of satisfied by that for sensitive use cases. Part of it is like, we, and we've talked about this show before, is the concept of a cloud of authentication, right? So it isn't necessarily the voice print, it's the voice print in where's the location of the device at the time of the voice print, what other devices do you have that also have authentication biometrically like, like wired into it, right? So are you wearing the AirPods? Are you wearing the Apple Watch? Are you in your home? I'm gonna plug Apple again and doing that via HomePod, like all of that, right? And I think it's one of these things where as you're talking about things like ear canals, which I never thought of before, simple fact is, the convenience factor of this, this is just going to fade into the background in a lot of cases, right? And it's like the the saying about uh, about good design is you don't even notice it. Like I shouldn't have to notice my biometric authentication. That should just basically happen over time. And then one other point I want to make also is as I was because as, as you were talking, a lot of interesting thoughts came to mind is the idea that we're talking about like the obvious stuff, like log into my bank account, do stuff. But you ever been to an Amazon Go? Yeah, yeah, man. Yep. Yeah. Isn't that a crazy experience to walk in and like walk out and think to yourself, I feel like I just committed a crime. I feel like I'm stealing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. Right. So for those of you who don't know, Amazon has developed a couple of concept shops called Amazon Goes, and they're they're slowly rolling out more of these. But it's a convenience store with no people working there. Like there's people working, stocking stuff and explaining to you because it's still first generation. But you yeah. can go in, shop, pick up whatever you want. And there's cameras and sensors everywhere. They can tell what you picked up and what you put down and everything. And it charges your Amazon account as you leave, right? So that's that's Amazon now. That's not overly friendly because you have to scan in your app yeah. when you come in and when you leave, it knows you're leaving. So therefore it just charges your account. But you can very easily envision a world whereby my biometric identity, by entering into that store, I have given consent to identifying who I am, right? And basically by picking things up to walk out. I have given consent that I am agreeing to purchase this and I walk out and none, there's no scanning. There's no nothing. It just happens. Like that's where this all could potentially lead. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Again, it's just like, it's, it's so frictionless. It feels like you're stealing. It feels like theft. Yeah. It's funny. Cause there's like tech reporters who actually tried to steal like with the permission of the company to oh, try really? to like, yeah, the, they've actually got in and tried to shoplift with the permission of Amazon just to test the system and they have not been able to pull it off. Like literally done things like quickly move, move stuff around shelves or like, or, or like, like do the things. Indiana Jones, like you pull yeah, up. Like, the <laughs> yeah. Cause it's not, again, it, it's similar, similar concept of the cloud of identity. It's not relying on one sensor to yeah. say, Oh, you did this. It's real. It's relying on like a combination of weight and a combination of like, of, of, of yeah, weight sensors, uh, motion sensors, cameras, video authentication, like it's just, it's nuts. And it's, I'm, I'm sure probably NFC chips and some of this stuff too, but you start thinking about the application for that going forward. And, you know, we could be in a, yeah, you just grab whatever you want, walk out in the world uh, in a lot of different places. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think that kind of, uh, again, it, it, uh, it applies to that sort of uh, user experience in mobile as well, just staying out of the way, unless you absolutely have to interrupt something kind of goes to that, that that's Agreed. The philosophy. Agreed. So that's, you know, we talked about the, give me, give me something else that what's the, the ear one's interesting. What's the craziest one or the coolest one you've seen that may not make it to consumer anytime soon. Like which one of you basically said, Oh my God, like that is doable. It's just to put you on the spot. You know? Yeah. Cause I <laughs> thought ear canal was uh, pretty crazy. Um, I, I got, I'm not going to lie. That is crazy. Um, <laughs> I haven't contemplated that. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I guess the, is that as crazy as it gets? I am certain that it's not because again, you wouldn't <laughs> believe the minds that are thinking about this stuff and figuring it out. There's no way I know the complete sort of breadth of all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, like I've even um, heard ones that, you know, concepts for the Apple watch where you would basically look at your heartbeat pattern yeah. or your ECG would basically be your, your, yeah. your print. Well, so in terms of that, you know, there's also, there's like hand vein scanning. Um, I don't yeah. know if you've heard of that where it's actually, it's like, it's not fingerprint. It's not sort of, what's on the outside. It's literally what's inside of your skin. And there is certain technology that can uh, determine where the veins are in your hand. And as you might, not just in your hand, but in your hand, for example. And uh, as you might imagine, that's a pretty unique identifier of people. I've never used that. I think it is, there are like use cases out there where it's being used, 
I think some phones might even do it, but I've never experienced that myself. Well, that seems like a, you know, same basic concept behind retinal scans, right? Retinal scans yeah. are looking at veins in the back of your eye, right? And to yeah. me, that's a far less invasive uh, yeah. methodology for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me about this. So we talked about a lot of kind of out there stuff too. Like when talking to financial institutions about implementation of this stuff, like barrier understanding or or willingness to uh, to adopt. Like, what are their reactions? Like, I'm sure I'm sure, especially with the, the world of finance, they want to see somebody else do it before they do it themselves, right? I think there's definitely some of that. And again, it some of it going back to what we were talking about earlier. It stems from sort of seeing the headlines of some of these more consumer grade technologies actually mm-hmm. getting hacked. That is part of the uh, apprehension in some cases about adopting it. And, you know, another sort of uh, disadvantage potentially of the device native item is we hear this from customers. This is a big one. We eventually work through this because there's an alternative to it, but I don't know that everybody knows there's an alternative. On most devices, Apple, iPhone, for example, I don't have children, but I have friends with children and you typically you know, enroll a biometric profile for your children on your phone so that they can get in there as well. So mm-hmm. banks sometimes struggle with if junior gets into dad's phone, if we're simply sort of depending on the device itself saying, yes, this is a registered profile, which is essentially Mm. the extent of the information they can get. You don't necessarily want junior to be able to be making um, financial transactions. So that is something that banks are sometimes concerned about, you know, rightly so. But that's why, again, there is, there are these third-party providers, again, for very sensitive use cases, and that can then ensure that there is a sort of one-to-one matching of the user with the biometric sample and then with the verification so that you can be sure it's dad or mom making a transaction rather than than junior or something like that. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a bit of a gaping hole to me. I mean, you know, and you think about it, if you have multiple identities, and I know how you're talking, I mean, you're not really supposed to on like iOS devices, but hey, if you can put five thumbprints in there, my wife's thumbprint was one of them, right? Yeah. I think about that. But you would think that given the number of times the Apple stores had parents complain about kids buying in-game purchase stuff without their permission, that they would, you know, <laughs> they would be incentivized to solve this problem. But, you know, <laughs> it's what it is. But uh, it's, yeah, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. A lot of these devices are developed on a one-to-one relationship or assumption as opposed to one-to-many. And that's got to be a challenge, especially like how do you map short of, I mean, short of having like separate logins or you know, log in, you know, this pro, full profiles with a, on a single iPhone. How do you get there? And I mean, you know, you're talking about the one to one versus one to many. And I think just another thing I like to try to clarify for people too is, you know, sometimes facial recognition or identity use cases where it is a one to many, hey, can we find a person in the crowd? There's tends to be some, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, there's headlines about this. And how the, that that facial recognition can be biased, right? There was a big story in the New York Times about a black oh, man yeah. who was mistakenly identified as as this uh, suspect, spent time in jail as a result, if I'm not mistaken. But there is some fear, some fear in terms of consumers, et cetera, about facial recognition for those sorts of use cases. But this is very obviously, maybe not, it's not obvious. That's why I continue to bring it up. But that's a different type of facial recognition. Don't get me wrong. In the verification, where it's I sort of explicitly consent to using my face to log into an app, there still can be bias in that technology mm-hmm. as well, but still sort of the repercussions are a little bit lesser. You know, like maybe- yeah, you're not going to jail for it. Right. And someone can't log into their bank account on their mobile phone. So do not get me wrong. I still think that's a big deal. And I still think that there is some inequity that can occur in that way. Mm-hmm. But again, the repercussions are a little bit lesser. And luckily, a lot of um, technology providers are working on that bias. You probably know. And I don't know, you know, we don't have to continue. Down well, no, this I mean, no, path, no, but you're right. right. I mean, like no systems without bias. Right. And it's been proven that it just seems like facial recognition tends to be more accurate with white people, right. largely probably because white people who program these things train them yeah. on their own faces. Right. Yes, and there's even you know, recently the entire fiasco with the Apple credit card, where it's like there appeared to be a possible apparent oh, bias right. against women. Right. Like. There's no system that can be developed without that's that once you release it in the wild, you're not going to find some inherent bias. In it. It's just humans are not without bias and, and, and what we built isn't. So, but we can correct for it is the issue. Exactly. Recognizing that the bias is there, 
and then doing what you can to mitigate that bias and solve it. Yeah. yeah, totally. yeah. And I'm not punishing the companies for coming out with these things without like, because again, like you don't know how these things are going to work until you put them in the wild. Right. And, you know, you roll it out to, to millions of people simultaneously. That's how you find it out. Right. And then the one columnist who basically called Apple like sexist for it, it was just like, come on, like, OK, like there's an algorithm here. Something's not ha- something like two things, two or three things are lining up incorrectly and, and basically correlating with women. Let's just fix this. Right. Well, like, and it's not just Apple. Like, I mean. Oh, it, oh, yeah. They just get they get the headlines. Right. Like, that's what yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 Good. So before we wrap up, I have three questions I ask every guest uh, to get okay. you thinking. So the first one I have for you is if you had one wish for something you could change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? The one thing I would change would be to encourage more people to be getting more specific about the fraud that is happening. And I'm talking, of course, financial services specifically, but how much fraud is mm-hmm. happening on that mobile channel versus other channels, just to ensure that we are securing all, all of our mobile apps in the same way that we are, we've sort of learned, though we're not perfect at it yet, to uh, secure a lot of our web apps that we use each day. I just think we're still not catching up in being proactive enough in securing those mobile apps, and it's gonna bite us in the butt eventually if we don't move fast. Well, it's interesting. I'm curious. Do you have any do you have any data on how much of that is how much is being pumped through those how much fraud is occurring in that channel versus uh, traditional online? I myself do not have specific data on that. I just know that a lot of people are reporting on digital fraud. So to start to dive a little bit deeper into web versus mobile, I think would be helpful in just showing us that you know, the multiple spots where that can be happening so that we can take mobile app security just a little bit more seriously. So I think I think that would be one of the big things that I would change. Interesting. So next question, I'm going to change this one a little bit. Normally, it's uh, what's been the biggest challenging in the company to where it is to date? I want that question answered specifically in the in the realm of biometrics. So when, when going out to market and growing the biometric side of this business, what's been the biggest challenge that you encounter? Again, I think, and I, and I, I talked to this, I, I hate to repeat myself, but again, really breaking down the sort of perception that biometric systems can be easily beat. Again, some of those consumer grade devices, some of those headlines where the sensitivity is leaning a little bit more towards convenience rather than security, that can be true. But you know, again, the technology today has innovated to a point where there is liveness detection to ensure that things like a 3D printed fingerprint or a yep. mask or things like that cannot defeat this technology these days. So again, we just have to be continually educating our customers and prospects about how robust some of this liveness detection has become. So that I guess that would be one challenge yeah, in going I, to market. I feel like it's interesting. Like I feel like there's a dichotomy in the in the reporting on this. And specifically, you're right. Like when Apple or anyone comes out with a new metric or new method for security, right? It's like I remember like stupid stuff like basically people saying, oh, they got face ID to, or or touch ID to work with their nipple. Or they could again reproduce a a artificial thumb and and do that sort of stuff, right? Or identical twins managing to fool face ID or you yeah. know, like they, you know, and they, and they say it like, look, the probability is not zero. The probability is like one in like X number of, you know, hundreds of thousands, whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which like, what are the odds? Like, I mean, if your probabilities are, are likening to winning the Powerball lottery, then I'll take that bet that it's probably secure. <laughs> right. So you have that and people focus in on, Oh, see, I told you this stuff doesn't work yet. Meanwhile, then you get like the San Bernardino shooter who like, Oh, the FBI is like, you got to crack this for us. We can't open it. Right. It's like, if it was that easy, <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, law yeah, enforcement right. would never pressure Apple to basically get around it. I think that's an interesting point. Yeah. 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 So it's uh, it just, again, it depends on which headlines and whose angle, right? So the last question for you before we wrap up is what excites you the most about what it is you're working on on a daily basis and keeps, keeps you going? So that would be these biometrics that are going on. It's so fun to be thinking about, you know, because right, we're, we will be offering voice soon within our our solution set. And so thinking about those use cases, understanding the technology and how that works is is very exciting. And just being able to, one, we're making it easier to do mobile financial services. We're helping our customers make that easier for their users. Hopefully that is making mobile banking, for example, or mobile financial services more accessible for more people. 
And then at the same time, as we're helping our customers bring more of those services to more people to then also be able to help them ensure that they are secure mobile experiences as well, it gets me going. Because I know that we're helping protect you, we're helping protect me, we're helping protect your family, my family, my friends, the world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I go a little superhero on it, but really it, it feels good. Make mobile financial services more accessible, easier to use, and ensure that those experiences are being secured appropriately. I think it's interesting because, I mean, I've had other guests on the show where... We discussed uh, voice response technology and, and lack of adoption rates, right? And how financial institutions are looking to get into it, but the adoption rates are low. And I, you know, I've got a multi-tiered thesis on this. I think first off, it, it represents a paradigm shift in, in UI. And basically, we are of a generation that was born constantly looking at a screen to get things done. Whereas I always use this crazy example of my daughter at 18 months reaching over, pushing the button on my iPhone, on my Apple Watch, and going blah 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 blah, because it was something <laughs> she was. But it was something that she was, and I, I it like, I was like, oh my god, you got to be kidding me! And meanwhile, my kids, I've got every smart speaker known to man, and my kids love to ask Siri for different songs or jokes or whatever, right? So they are yeah. growing up voice natives, right? For the rest of us, it comes down to what's the use case that's going to drive me to learn that behavior. And that behavior, like to date, what can I do? I can check my balance. That's great. I'm yeah. not necessarily looking for Alexa to allow, and I'm sorry if I activated anyone's Alexa, to <laughs> allow a you know me to trade stocks online with a voice command because like, a, are you going to hear that right? B, somebody else could do it, right? I think to myself, yeah. like, you, you guys, I, I think the cracking of, of voice as a biometric proof uh -huh. is security proof is, is just going to massively increase the value proposition for a lot of these voice response tools. So I'm glad you're doing that because I think it's going to, that's a vital hurdle to jump over. Without a doubt. Yeah, completely agree. Let me say, hey, Alexa, send X some money. And then allowing that to happen, they know it's me and they are validating my identity based on my voice. Yeah. Like you said, it, it's, it's without a doubt. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, Sam, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate this. And I hope everybody finds this informative and uh, some of the, you know, there's some, some podcasts where we talk more about technology. It sounds like it's from the distant future, but actually happening in our real life. And I think this is definitely up there. So I think uh, it's going to be things that people aren't used to hearing. Great. And hey, thanks so much for having me. This was uh, this was really fun. I had a great time. My pleasure. Take care. All right. You too. So I hope you enjoyed that interview from one span. And every time you look at Face ID or Touch ID, I hope you think of this podcast. So as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at Jason